And um, Sam Gosling, who is Associate Professor of Psychology at the University of Texas at Austin, will be talking to us about this. Sam has made important contributions to the study of personality in animals. Not so long ago, most scientists thought they didn't have any personality. And to manifestations of human personality in our environments. He is the author of Snoop, What Your Stuff Says About You, which was out in 2008 and which you can find at www.snoopology.com. With that, I welcome Dr. Gosling. Thanks so much. Cool. Thank you. Thanks for having me. OK. Oh, man. Sorry. All right. All right. OK, here we go. OK, well, thanks so much for having me here today. Um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, my research on the connections between people and their stuff. Um, and uh, let's start by looking at one of the um, uh, spaces that we studied. So this is one of them. So. This was an early study we did of people, uh, of uh, students in their dorm rooms. Uh, and, you know, and it, it doesn't, I mean, most people think that people's um, personalities leave traces in the spaces they occupy. And, and, and here, here you do see that, right? And here you see a sensation seeker. Is this going like this? I can't see. Is this not working? Oh, you see, that's maybe a very flash screen, but it doesn't, the laser pointer doesn't work on it. It's ridiculous. Isn't it? <laughs> No, it's okay, but isn't that, isn't, I mean, isn't that odd? I mean, I mean you, you have, a, I mean, it's good, I mean, it is good, it is flash, but it is also, also annoying. So there you go, all right. Well, they, okay, I can't point to all the points. Okay, so what you see is, uh, you see a snowboard, a right, sensation seeker, a snowboard, a surfboard, a skateboard. What I would be pointing to you is those boxes have a bunch of uh, liquor in them too. Um, so, so, you know, so people leave traces, and more than that, more than that, and this is, this is important, I mean, it's kind of one of the things that seems, is obvious but important, right, is that we do different things with our spaces. So these are two, is it just, does this one look wider than that one, or is it just because I'm standing here? No. Okay, all right, okay, all right, very good. Uh, so uh, you'll, what you'll see here is that, right, this is, exa this is exactly the same space, first of all. So these are just uh, dorm rooms, actually, in the dorm across the, uh, aqu across the way here. And I went in, and I just stood on the sink next to the door and took the picture. And these are different dorm rooms, obviously. But it's not like these people knew I was coming, right? This, this is what they look like on an everyday basis. Those, those slippers are aligned next to the bed every day. That's what, and they are. That's what they're really like. And this person's place is like this. And, you know, and I think you, know, some, you, you can look at either and be horrified, right, depending on your own disposition. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, the point is that, there is, that, is that not only do we leave differences, but, but they're different. Different people leave different uh, traces in their spaces. Um, not just in residential environments, uh, office spaces too. Uh, so you know, there's all kinds of things when you begin to look at uh, of the ways people leave traces of who they are in these spaces and just you know flicking through a couple of photos to begin you know the way they arrange their book for example and, and uh, this is an office space um, what do you put up on your desk right? these are all things that somehow got there right what, at one point those things weren't in that space and they are now and if they have some and if you had something to do with them getting there then we may be able to learn something about you by looking at, at what those objects are yeah, and, and how they are, et cetera. Uh, this is another uh, office we, uh, that this one was in our study. Anyway, so the point is that our personality gets revealed in all kinds of places. And there are, there are a huge number of places, potentially, where our personality might show up. Um, so you can imagine things. Uh, so your personality might show up in your nationality, your social life, the friends you have, how you write, the injuries you sustain, and so on. And you can split these up which becomes uh, useful later on in, in, into a number of dimensions. First of all, they vary in how public they are. So some of the, um, uh, you know, there's no point in me looking at the screen, given it's not working, is it? Um, so, uh, so, they vary, so for example, so things like how attractive you are, or your or websites, or your bump stickers, those are very public things like your underwear, your journal entries, your passwords, presumably those things are more private. And then they also vary in the extent to which you have control over them. So you don't have much control over your nationality, your dreams, perhaps your injury. You have a lot of control over your answer machine message, your movie preferences, and so on. So you can see that most of them fall into this top right quadrant. Uh, we, they are things that are for other, others can see, and we have control over them. But there are circumstances when we might want to look at other things too. For example, if we think that somebody's trying to fool us, then we'll want to look in places where they think are private, comparing private and public spaces, and so on. 
Um, so what I'm going to do is briefly touch on some of the research we've done in our lab. Um, we're looking at three major domains. So we've looked at people's physical environments, like their offices and their home spaces. We've looked at their virtual environments, like their personal websites, and uh, more recently, in, uh, and uh, uh, what we're doing these days is looking at uh, Facebook profiles, um, and also the oral environments, the music they choose to listen to. So what by, the, what, by these spaces, and of course you can see I'm construing space very, very broadly, what by, uh, by these space, might these spaces tell us about these people? So let's take a step back. Why would we even think somebody's space might tell us something about them? What are the, what are the processes by which personality gets translated into, into physical um, uh, elements in your space? Well, the first process I think that links us to our space is what I call identity claims. So identity claims are these deliberate statements we make about ourselves to others and also sometimes to ourselves. So that we're, it's an expression of our attitudes and our values. This was one of the rooms in one of the studies where people put stuff up on their doors. Doors are a great place to look for identity claims, right? Because they are so, you know who it's associated with. It's associated with the occupant of this person, but it's clearly for other people, right? If you are in the office, you don't get to see it, but others do. So it's really attaching a certain sentiment with you. So in this case, you know, be your own goddess is one of the, one of the, the bumper stickers there. Um, put a brain in the White House. The so various different messages that you send to others. Deliberate statements to yourself and others. Now another way we affect the environment is not is something we do deliberately, like identity claims, but it's not primarily for a communicative function. What it's there for is to affect how we feel. Now, that, now the easiest way we do this is with our music collection. So here are, here are a couple of tenths. So this is two, two participants in our studies. And you can look and you can see the sorts of music you play really can affect the, the sorts of moods, the thoughts and feelings you have. If you want to get pumped up for a night on the town, you listen to lively music. If you want to relax in the bath, or if you want to just unstress, you listen to other sorts of music. So, so you can look at the sorts of music people habitually use in order to um, affect certain, um, so, uh, uh, certain feelings and thoughts. Now, of course, we use other methods too. We, don't we, we can do this with physical things too. So the photos we put up, if you put up a photo of a loved one or a special object or a, or a favorite pet or something like that, there, that is a way of also making yourself feel a certain way. It's not there for others. It's not an identity claim. It's there for you, but you've done it deliberately. So that's, that's an, a, another way. These, these are what I call thought and feeling regulators. A third mechanism um, linking us to our places um, is what I call behavioral residue. And this is from the fact that we, we conduct many acts and behaviors in our spaces, whether they're our workspaces or our home spaces, and a subset of these behaviors, not all of them, but a subset of them leave a residue in the environment. So if you read a lot of books, you might have a lot of books, and if you don't organize them, they might look like this, and you might be able to look at various things. You can look inside the books. You can say, are they marked? Have they been read? Have the corners been turned over? All kinds of things. So there's so these are, these, are, the, these are actions that aren't to make a person feel a certain way, like thought and feeling regulators. They're not there to send signals to others. They are just the unintended consequences of our actions. Um, this was one of the rooms in one of our studies, too, you see? And people always say, to, um, oh, surely everybody tidied up their space before your team came around. Well, uh, maybe. Maybe this person did tidy up. <laughs> This is it on a good day, who knows? But anyway, so, so you, you, you can see there, it does, and if, <coughs> excuse me, here is uh, one of the offices we started. You can see that through these processes, um, there are a lot of uh, people leave their, uh, many, many different uh, clues about what they're like in their spaces. Um, okay, okay, how do we study? I'm going to tell you about the, 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 the first study we did to give you an idea of how we went about looking at this. Um, so what we did was we um, sent a team into people's spaces. This is one of the first studies we did. This is in a dorm room study. And you can see this is a, this is a sort of split-level dorm room. And I'm standing on the top of the steps taking a photo down of my team. So my team would go in. They each have a clipboard. And their job is to go in and just to rate the personalities of the people in these spaces. I'm not, and I don't give them clues. I'm not trying to optimize the process. What I'm trying to see is do, what do we all learn in our ordinary, everyday perception processes. If you and I went in, what impressions would we form about this person? So they're filling out 
questionnaires independently. They're not, they're not allowed to talk to each other or discuss it or anything. They just look around and think, okay, is this person talkative? Look around, check. And so they go through this questionnaire and do that. Now, one of the first decisions we had to make when we were looking at this was, what are we going to do with photos of people? Um, photos are interesting because we know that people form impressions of others on the basis of just a photograph. We also know that um, there's some validity to some of those impressions for some of the traits. So you, so you can get certain things right just by looking at a photo of someone. So our first impulse was let's remove all the photos. But then we thought, no, it's kind of important, right, which photos you have. Do you have a photo of yourself, you know, sitting and meditating on top of a mountain in India? You know, that, that, is that the one you choose to display of the 10,000 you could? Or the photo of yourself, you know, drunkenly yelling at the camera with all of your friends as you, you know, you know, stagger out, out of a pub somewhere. You know, and then, you know, the, the ones you choose to have. You have so much choice about which ones you put up. Why, why these ones? Why these ones? If you ask people, of course, they don't say, well, I want to express my, you know, my identity as a whatever, whatever they say. Oh, I just like it. But why do you like it? It, it matters which one you put up. So, so we didn't want to remove them. So um, what we ended up doing was we ended up putting yellow post-it uh, post-its over the people themselves. So you couldn't see what the person looked like, but you could see what they were doing. And, and, that, and, that, and that was a, you know, that was quite a good solution. I mean, you know, you, you, you'd see a post-it meditating on top of a mountain or whatever, <laughs> or with some ransom. Uh, so you'd see that, and, but also it gave us a very quick clue of, of like, you know, of, of how many photos of themselves people had. Like some people's walls were plastered with post-its, you know, shrines to themselves. It was quite amazing. So anyway, so that's what we did. We sent them in. They went in and formed their impression. Then we sent a different team in to go in and record the items in the spaces. So what are the spaces of people who are view, thought to be extroverted or, or, or broad-minded or something like that? So they go in and they write down both broad terms, like is it colorful, is it distinctive, is it stylish, is it warm, um, th those sorts of things, and also specific items. If there are books, what are the books? How many books are there? Chairs, how many chairs? Is there a clock? How many clocks? Are the clocks on time? Are they fast? Is there trash? Is it empty? Is it full? And so on. So lots of specific items too. Uh, and here you see a team going around. This is the uh, study of authors we did. They're, doing, they're, they're recording uh, various elements of it too. And then what we did was we asked people about um, about the, the occupants themselves. They filled out a personality questionnaire and two people who knew the occupants very well told us what they're like, right? Because sometimes, if I want to know some things, I should ask you, right? If I want to know if you worry a lot, I should probably ask you. You, you know that. You're sitting there, and for, for, as far as everyone else is concerned, you're, you're, you're perfectly fine, but you're constantly worrying. It's, it's only you who, you know, familiar with the demons, whereas the other people don't see those. Um, whereas for other things, I should ask other people, right? If I want to know if you are um, stingy, Right, then other people are the best judge, right? Because they're the ones who get <laughs> stuck, say, you know, having to pay the extra 25 cents because you only had a water and they all had a iced tea. Um, so anyway, so, so they, so they are. So anyway, so so they filled it, and and where we measured them is a number of things, but especially we used uh, the most widely accepted model of personality traits now, which is known as the Big Five personality dimensions. Now, that what this means. Is these are very broad dimensions, and it's not like you are one or the other. What you are is you have one, um, you, have a, you have five scores, a score on each of these dimensions. Openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, and agreeableness, and neuroticism, which spell ocean, to help you remember, or canoe, if you prefer. You can all remember. <laughs> um, okay, so what are these? So the, it's really important to know that these are very broad dimensions. That, that's a crucial thing. Uh, so they include, men, so I, I have some icons which I associate with each of these to try and help you remember them. So the first, I call openness the Leon, Leonardo factor, right? He was a philosopher, an artist, a naturalist, you know, all kinds of things. And so this is people who like to try new things. They're high on intellect, imagination, curiosity, creativity, versus people who are more traditional, versus people who are are more concrete, um, and n neither one of these poles is better than the other. They're different. Di one pole is better for some things; other poles are better for others. So, if, to think, think. If you want to know if you are open yourself, think about what happens when you go into a restaurant you've never been to. You open the menu. Do you? What happens when you look at the menu? Do you look at the item that you've never seen before, and do you say, "I don't know what that is. I'll have that. Bring it on." 
or do you, in fact, do you actually not open the menu? Say, I like spaghetti. I like what I know. I, know, I like. I know what I like. I like what I know. Bring me, bring me the spaghetti. That would suggest your lower on the experience dimension. Okay, the second dimension, conscientiousness. So this isn't, it's a bad label, really, but it's not about conscience, really. It's about all the stuff that goes on in your frontal cortex. It's planning, it's thinking before you act, it is um, uh, controlling your impulses. Um, this, uh, so I, Robocop is my icon here. As you may remember, he was a half man, half machine, all cop. Um, you probably remember that. And so, he, so these people have, uh, they, they don't, you know, they don't run out of supplies. They, 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 uh, these are the, I always think these are the people you want in the air traffic control tower because they show up to, on work, to work on time, they pay attention. Um, so so the, the, these people, you know, versus people who are low on this, they forget stuff, they run out of supplies, they're impulsive. Extroversion uh, is the, uh, the Beverly Hills cop factor, or, or frankly, any character played by Eddie Murphy. Uh, so these are sort of like, out, so these are sort of outgoing. With a certain, it's, it's pretty much like we think of it. These are people who are enthusiastic, energetic. They tend to be more uh, dominant versus people who are calm and quiet and, and prefer to stay in. Agreeableness, um, I used to call the Mother Teresa factor. Um, because the people are kind and warm until, until my uh, agent told me actually, uh, that she was uh, manipulative and domineering. <laughs> so, I, so I now call that the Mr. Rogers factor, <laughs> who, who, as you probably know, was uh, so nice. Uh, he was reputed so nice that he had his car stolen once. Now, there was a uh, story in the newspaper read, and the people returned the car, saying, if we had known it was your car, we wouldn't have <laughs> stolen it. <laughs> That's how, how nice. So anyway, so you, versus the, the, other, uh, the other end of the scale might be people who, who don't mind telling you how it is. They are blunt. They're not trying to protect your feelings. You know, the, the, you know, the guy Simon on American Idol is probably a good example of that. Neuroticism. Uh, so these people are highly strung. They're easily stressed out. Um, you guys probably all guessed the icon uh, for that one. There you go. Absolutely. There you go. Woody Allen. <laughs> The high strong, and, and uh, you know, and then uh, the, really, I think of the, the way I like to think about this is how easily ruffled are you? Are you do you do you easily get ruffled and, and thrown off? Versus people at the other the the icon at the other end of me is um, uh, the dude from the Big Lebowski. You, 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 you probably remember he didn't even get upset when um, nihilists urinated on his rug. So that, that's how uh, that's. Uh, how calm he was. All right. Um, okay. So there are these. Five, so we're measuring in terms of these five dimensions. So I want you to be thinking about these dimensions as we go through the spaces and thinking. What, what do you think? What we should these? Do you think you can pick up in people's spaces? Okay. So here, here is uh, some three spaces from one of our studies. And and what uh, what I like about this is it's really essentially the same space, right? They each have a cubicle, but if you look at the spaces, you can see they've done really quite different things with them in terms of what they put up, in terms of the way they arrange uh, the items, in terms of what the items in those spaces are. And the question is whether or not those give clues to what the people um, are like. So we, as I said, we studied people's uh, so, it's a, in this design, we just sent my judges into these people's spaces. They formed an impression, and then we looked at it. Uh, then we examined the extent to which those impressions uh, correlated with what the occupants were really like. We also then looked at the items in those spaces and saw which items were associated with the impressions of the people, and which items were actually diagnostic of what the people were like. Often they were the same. Sometimes they weren't. As I mentioned before, so I showed you this one before. So this, we also did this with music collections. So in this case, what we did was we asked people their, their favorite music, and, and we went to quite a lot of lengths to make sure it was their real, their real top ten. Right? If I asked you to give me, I said, give me, give me your top ten now, it would be quite hard just to come up with it on the spot. So we got people to do it, and then we got them to think about it for a week and come back and revise it if they wanted to. Then we saved all of their songs to a CD, and then we gave this, this CD of their top ten songs to, to people and said, okay, Tell us what you think this person's like on the basis of these top ten songs. That's all they had. That's all they knew about the person. And make a judgment. So, but you, you look at these, right? And you immediately get a, a, impression, a di different impression of what, what these people might be like. Now, one of the issues we have is, is I made a distinction earlier on between identity claims, these sort of statements we make deliberately to others, and behavioral residue. And I said they're different. And I think they are separable processes, but sometimes when you're in a space, it's difficult for people to know whether th this item is an identity claim or just a behavioral residue. So we looked at the, that person with the snowboard there, right? You have a snowboard. So maybe that having the snowboard there really does reflect your tendency to 
go out and uh, engage in sensation-seeking activities. But maybe the fact that you leave it out for other people to see is also an identity claim. You're also making statements to others with at the same time. So what we wanted to do was find a domain where you could separate these things, where you own, there were only things that you put, were put there deliberately because you put them there to tell other people. So that's, why we, uh, well, that's what uh, prompted our initial study of personal websites. So personal websites, you know, where everything on a personal website is there because you put it there. Right, it's nothing got, I mean, maybe there's typos or something like that, but it's all there as statements to others, and these were publicly listed um, websites, so these were for other people to see. We, uh, this was from a directory where in olden days when you had to actually submit your website to a directory to have it. Um, so just to give you an idea, I have a few of the websites that we had in our study, just so you can kind of see how, how diverse they were. These were in them, so that... These are old, of course. I used to, when, I, when, when we first did this in olden days, what we had was I used to say, for those of you who have never seen a website, a you know, personal website, this is what it looks like. Now it's kind of historical. For those of you who don't remember what personal websites used to look like, this is what these, you never see them anymore, right? But you used to. So there you go. You can see there's quite a variety. There they are, just flicking through. Yeah, this one's good. You see, this one. So this also have information about the person's movie preferences. There, some poetry that person has put their schedule down. Um, here we go. So here, this one has all kinds of things. So this is this has a, this person has a photo of their office. You have information about their office. It looks like a really fascinating person to hang out with, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just the person stuck in an elevator with. All right. Uh, then. Uh, then th th that person has a mood diary. They're just writing their moods. So you're looking, about, looking at their habitual moods they get into, their cats. And then look, here is this, you know, Miguel's homepage. This, right, this is identity claims. What, what else is it, right? It's, these are symbols made to others about, in this case, the uh, gay Hispanic frat boy. But, you know, you get, but, but, that, but, you know, but that's what they are. That's what it means, right? Um, now, of course, unlike, unlike the people's uh, physical spaces, we weren't able to cover up people's uh, photographs, but so, uh, uh, so, so, so that was a difference. You'd think, we thought people would only have flattering photos of themselves <laughs> on one of the photos on one of the websites we looked at. It is, I suppose, possible that that's the most flattering angle the person could find. <laughs> And then, of course, of course, now the you know the the you know the contemporary version of of um, of web pages and everything else are, are Facebook. It's Facebook or other social networking sites. And so now we've done quite a lot of research looking at what can you learn about somebody just from looking at their Facebook profile. Do, do, does a Facebook profile give an accurate impression of what the person's like, or does it give more of a more of an impression that is is, is there you know is is uh, is molded to try and make a person uh, appear a certain way? Um, Okay, so again, here are those big five that I showed you earlier. So uh, think about which of these domains do you think, which of these big fives do you think show up most uh, easily in these domains? Which of the ones um, show, uh, and uh, in which domains would you be able to pick up these different, these, uh, different dimensions? So I'm going to show you um, now just a, a summary of, of the results across the different studies. Um, so anyway, so here you see the big five. Uh, uh, annoyingly, I've put them in a different order, but you, you can figure it out, right? So I'm sure you can figure out which is which. And then um, what we have here is the some of the different domains that we've looked at. So we have people's, what can you learn about somebody? You know nothing about them other than looking at their Facebook profile. Your website, you know nothing about them other than going to their website. You've You've, uh, or you've just snooped around their bedroom, you've looked at their office, you've just listened to their music top ten, you've just um, listened to their social behavior, this is where they listen to recordings of people, they carry around tape recorders uh, for, for uh, four days, which come on a few seconds and often just listening to that will keep about somebody, or the final one's actually meeting someone, actually having a five minute meeting for someone. Um, so uh, let's look at um, bedrooms uh, first. So uh, let's have a show of hands here, because otherwise, if I don't do a show of hands up, First, and afterwards, everyone goes, well, that's obvious, I knew that. Um, so, uh, so, okay, so who thinks that uh, uh, the, the extra, you'll be able, so you're allowed to vote uh, more than one if you want, and, and the clue is that at least one of the traits does show up in bedrooms. That's your clue. That's the question. Yes, absolutely, please do. 
Sorry? You're, you're talking about the accuracy of the... So, so, I'm, so I'm now, so these are going to reflect the correlations between what judges who have only seen, in this case, your bedroom, how strongly that correlates with the combination of what the occupant him or herself says about him and what the occupant's two friends who know the occupant well have said about the occupant. Good, great question. Yeah, that's, that's what I mean. Okay, so are you guys ready to vote? Are these people's dorm rooms or they're someone that's going to This This is people's dorm rooms, good question too. So it's broader than a bedroom, right? Because people, uh, you know, they entertain there, they eat there, they work there, etc. Uh, but it, it, they're the ones which uh, uh, belong to one person. So, okay, so what do we have? So, uh, but, okay, so first of all, who is not going to vote? <laughs> okay, so that's two people, three people. Okay, four people. Everybody else is going to vote. Very, all right, that's good. Okay, so who thinks uh, extroversion shows up strongly in people's bedrooms? Raise your hand. Bedrooms? What? Dorm rooms. Dorm rooms, dorm rooms, dorm rooms. Dorm rooms. Okay, very good. Uh, who thinks agreeableness shows up? All right. Uh, conscientiousness? Lots of people. All right. Uh, neuroticism? Lots of people. <laughs> Openness? Um, medium amount of people. All right. Well, what is it? Okay, so what I've done is a blob analysis, which is a very complicated form of analysis that I happen to invent, where what it is is it's just, uh, it's just a... A correlations and the bit, you guys. I should learn, I, I should try and learn from you guys how you explain correlations to people because. Correlations. Or just how do you explain what a correlation like three means? I mean, how how do you translate anyway? Okay, uh, so what I've done is a blob analysis. The bigger the blob, the stronger the correlation. That's all that means. All right. There it is. Okay. So which one? So. So what we find here, so I expected when I did this, I thought conscientiousness would be where all the action was. I thought that was really going to show up, are people organized, they get supplies, you know, that sort of thing. And indeed, we did have a pretty significant uh, correlation for the uh, for validity correlation for conscientiousness. However, everything, in fact, the, all the other correlations and all, all other correlations I've really seen in this were dwarfed by the accuracy of openness. Openness, people were uh, astonishingly good at picking up people's openness experiences from going around their spaces. They were also quite good, it turns out, in this domain for neuroticism, and I think it's for kind of odd reasons, uh, and, uh, and okay at picking up extroversion and agreeableness, all, although less good. How correlated are openness and extroversion? These are all relative, these are all independent dimensions, they're orthogonal dimensions. Okay. So being high on one does nothing about another. In theory, but yeah. Uh, okay, offices. Offices. We found um, that uh, openness again showed up as as the big uh, as the big one. There was also evidence for conscientiousness and extroversion, but agreeableness didn't really. Okay, so I'm not going to go through all of these piece by piece. I'll just I'll show you the, the rest now. And and you see that. But the lesson you you get from looking at this is that some domains are easier to judge in general. Right, so, and some are uh, harder to judge. So you'll see openness keeps showing up again and again. Agreeableness, really, you never get very strong validity correlations. And then you also see there's quite a lot of variation across domains. Some domains are generally better than others for, for figuring out what people are like in terms of these dimensions. Of course, there are lots of other dimensions too that you look at. Um, so, you know, the question, you know, people say, you know, where should I, where should I go to find out about somebody? You know, where, where, if I want to really snoop, where's the best place? And the answer is, well, it depends what you want to know. Yeah, did, did I see it? Well, it, it, it doesn't show up in social behavior as we operationalized it here, which is just listening to people, snippets of people's lives. You know, and, but a lot of these things take a long time. I mean, that's a good question. A lot of these things take, I mean, it helps you understand, well, what do we mean by agreeableness? And I think a lot of them have different, have different trajectories in terms of, of how long it takes to really know, know these things. So, you know, extroversion we pick up very, very quickly. That, you, know, that, you know, that's well known. You, know, you, you can pick up extroversion from less than, you know, less than, less than half a second. Yes? Is there any possibility that your, uh, the testers, the people that you're presenting, yeah. were perceived some of these things in a way that was below their level of their conscious writing? Sure, there is, but we didn't ask them to to, we just said, do you think this person's talkative or something like that? Well, I, I do see a lot of questions, and I, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and get, because I want to get through this talk, I'll be happy to take questions and all kinds of stuff. 
Um, but if it's, if it's something that's just not clear, then sorry, but I do want to make sure I get through to the rest of the findings. And I'll come back to it. Okay. So there, there are some of the findings. Um, so what did we learn? I'm snooping around. So you, if you're going around somebody's place, what are, so if, if, what are the tips that we can offer you if you're, if, if you're looking around people's place? Well, the first, the first is a general strategy, and that is when you are going into anybody's um, place, it's really you want to ask yourself three questions. You want to ask yourself, what is the item? First of all, what is the item that's there? That somebody has a desk calendar tells you something. That they have a desk calendar tells you, okay, that they at least have aspirations to be organized properly. Although you always have to compare it, you always have to compare it with others. Then you need to look at what is the state of that uh, object. So look, compare it. So if you have a desk calendar, but you know, is it? carefully filled out with all the buttons in green and the appointments in blue and you know meticulously done or is it not is it has it been put there and, and it's and it's two months out of date i see lots of desk calendars on people's on people's spaces um you know which like you know is you know just a sort of testament to self delusions about what what it, what it takes to get organized um uh, you know, which is, you know, just three months out of date that nobody has ever uh, done. So that's the second thing. So look, what is the object? What is its state? The state tells you how it's used. And then look at the location. The location is really important because that tells you about the psychological function it serves. So you can have one, uh, an object in one place can mean something very different in another place. One of the things I like to do when I go into people's uh, offices is look at their photographs. So here, this is a, a, a photograph. We, we went around some... Uh, the TV program, and they wanted us to go around the presenters' offices. Um, and here you see these are different sets. Of, sorry about the quality of the photos. These are different, different, different photos in the same office. These, these are all in the same office. And you look at them and say, oh, OK, they have a bunch of photos. But if you look at where those photos are positioned, that you can tell they're serving quite different functions. So you'll see the photos are, are there's a whole bunch of photos which go on the window ledge behind where the person sits. So the person isn't looking at those on a day-to-day -day basis. They are framed by them, right? Here, here I am, and these things behind me for you to see. Versus the ones you can see in the very top right corner is where there's other photos of which are pinned down to the bulletin board right in the eye line of the computer, uh, key, uh, computer monitor where the person's looking. So they serve very different functions. So, 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 um, one, so the ones on the... On the uh, bulletin board are a form of uh, thought and feeling regulators. Th these are these are what um, some researchers have called social snacks. So you know, just as you get hungry and you take, you may eat some peanuts to help you through the day, so you also get emotionally hungry. You're missing someone or something like that. And so you might have a photo of a loved one in a wallet or up on the wall in your office or something like that, where you can just take a quick emotional snack. You can look and feel, oh, there they are. Okay, get back to work or something like that. Whereas the ones in the, in the, in the frame, these are more like identity claims. That doesn't mean they're disingenuous. We, there's a lot of research showing that people want to be seen as they see themselves, but they're nonetheless, they're making statements to others. You see maybe, you often see people's you know, certificates, there are their degrees and awards and qualifications behind them here. It's, they're proud of this. They're not trying to do a fake impression, but they are, it is serving a different function. So when you go into somebody's office, look at the photos. Which way are they facing? Are they facing you, the visitor, or are they facing the person themselves? Um, okay, so that's location. Another really important uh, tip uh, was brought home to me by this man. I'm sure most of you don't know what that is, so I'll tell you. This is a, a bong for smoking marijuana. Um, okay, and this, this showed to me the importance of, uh, of, be, of being very wary about distinctive items. Distinctive items are, are dangerous because the very thing that makes them distinctive is that they stick out, right, is the thing that means you should ignore them. So the thing that you're less likely to ignore them than them sticking out is also the thing, is the reason you should. Because what we're looking for in spaces is themes. We want to look for overall themes. Any single object can be misleading. But distinctive items really stick out. So this was, this was a, a, one of the occupants in one of our first studies we did. It was somebody's bedroom, and it was obviously a very responsible, rather conservative, traditional person's room. And there in the corner was this blue plastic crate full of a bong and other drugs paraphernalia. And of course what happens is all of the people come into the office in the boring room, oh, look at that, and they go rushing over and spend a lot of time looking at the plastic crate. 
and of course then they base their instrument on that. Uh, so, which we, and then proceed to ignore all of the other consistent signals that are con consistent with each other in that space. So afterwards I asked the occupant, I said, well, what's going on with that? And she, she said, oh yeah, that, of course. Um, my roommate was going traveling around the world, and so she asked me to look after all of her stuff. And of course, being the good, responsible person she was, she put them all in a plastic crate, and then put them in the corner of her room for storage. So she was... <laughs> It did tell you about her. It did. It told you that she was responsible and kind and considerate, but not in the way you thought. So, so be very wary of um, distinctive objects. They, they're often misleading. It stuck out in a way that it wouldn't have from more of a rebel's room. Okay, this is a uh, plastic Virgin Mary, and the, and this the important. Uh, this tells us the lesson with this is to is that any single objects can have multiple meanings. And in order to disambiguate them, you have to look at the whole space. You have to look at the space. We're looking for themes here. So we went in and we saw this Virgin Mary, and had it been combined with, say, a crucifix and a Bible, then that would tell you somebody who's sort of like pious and observant, and that gives you one message. In this case, of course, it was combined with a velvet Elvis Presley a bed cover and a bunch of plastic pineapples, right? Which tells you it was more done in a sort of kitsch decor style, sort of playful person. So the very same object can have different meaning depending on the items that are there. Um, the importance of this item, the uh, Hemingway's Movable Feast, this, this was, uh, and the lesson here is really that we're not always uh, there to learn. We're not always there to, uh, is, uh, although it sounds kind of fun to say, what can you learn about somebody you've never met before by going through their space? That's you know, fun, but it's not very realistic, right? A far more realistic scenario is that you're going to someone's place who you already know a little bit. I mean, after all, you're in their place, right? You know them a little bit, but you want to learn more about them. And this shows you the importance of location. So this, uh, Lisa, this, this would belong to Lisa, a friend I had just met, and I went around a, a house for a cup of tea, and then, she, then I went to the bathroom, and to go to the bathroom, you go through the bedroom, and as I was going through the bedroom, I saw a little bookshelf in the, in the, in the room, and on the top of the bookshelf, there was a kind of little raised area, and then there was um, the movable feast sitting there, like it was clearly in a special place. So it was the low, but it was being sensitive to the location that told me that this was important, right? And so I didn't know what it meant, I didn't know what it meant, but I did know that it was a significant and important part of Lisa. So, so I asked her, I said, what's, what's the Hemingway book? And she told me. And, she told, and, and you know, that might not seem like a, a, you know, oh, uh, you know, that of an important thing, but you know, in her telling me why that was important to her, I learned things about her that many people who have known her for many years d still don't know about her in terms of what's important to her values and who she is. And that, of course, was uh, you know, consistent with other things I learned about her. Okay, so here is uh, stamps. Show of hands, please. Okay, who here carries uh, spare stamps in their wallet or their bag or something like that? Raise your hand if you do. Okay, now raise your hand if you do not carry. Okay, that's okay. So this was a slight. This was. Uh, I went to an audience the other day and there were three people. Okay, but this was about half and half. Well, what I find interesting about this here is not that this was about half. Not who who carries spare stamps and who doesn't. But what's most interesting, right, is the reactions of the people with their hands down at the time. And everyone's looking, looking at those people who, um, who, are, who don't carry stamps are looking at them and thinking, what? Like, I, I've never even thought of carrying, why would I carry spare stamps? And all the people who do, <laughs> everyone, everyone of the people who do carry the spare stamps, they're all thinking, well, what if you need to mail a letter? Like, what are you gonna do? <laughs> And so the, so, so the point of showing you this is, is that what individuals do seems self-evident. Like, oh, that's of course what you do. And that's why spaces are pretty hard, are hard to fake, I think. It's pretty hard to fake your personality. And also, um, uh, it shows you that sometimes you'll think you've got it wrong, but actually you haven't. People are just using a different standard. I mean, you, we, you know, you've all had that experience, right, where you're going to go into somebody's place and they go, don't come in, don't come in, it's a terrible mess. Right, and you go in, and you like look around, and you, the um, you know the, the vase is not properly centered on the table, or something like that. <laughs> and for them, and you know they're not trying to mess with you. For them, it really is a terrible mess. For them, it really it feels like that to them, because, and that's just because they have a different standard. 
They just have a different standard. My colleague, uh, Cindy, her, you know, she, if, if she, her office is immaculate. It's absolutely, you know, I could go in and I could put about one of the journals on the shelf, like half an inch, and she would notice it right away, and she wouldn't be able to work until that was put back in its place. Right. Whereas, whereas someone like me, you could you could come out, you could come and take all the journals and put them on their sides, right? And I wouldn't notice. In fact, a friend did that. A friend, a friend that was uh, was sitting in my house, and she moved all the things from one side of the kitchen to the other side of the kitchen. And then every time we met, she was kind of waiting for me to say something. Like, and after <laughs> months, she said, "Did you know?" And I, I, have no, I have no idea. She'd done it. So, um, <laughs> So, but anyway, it just shows you that you can't, so, and that's why these things are hard, hard to fake, because even if we wanted to create a false impression, even if I wanted to give the impression of being as meticulous and organized and foresighted as Cindy, I just don't see the world in a way that would allow me to do that. I wouldn't see things that she sees. So, so I think that's one of the reasons why they give. Okay, I just want to uh, finish, finish my talk by briefly talking about some uh, w w ways that some people are uh, looking at the connections between people and their places. And there's a local architect uh, here called uh, uh, Chris Travis, who runs an architecture firm called Sentient Architect. He's doing something that's really interesting. He's looking at the connections between people and their spaces in order to design homes um, for them. Um, so what he does is he engages in very, very intense interviews, extensive interviews, about uh, which people, uh, which, uh, with, with people about their basic associations with space. What, tell me about a place you felt when you were happy. You, know, you come and you create this, 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 uh, uh, this uh, imaginary place. Where, and he encourages you to be playful and imaginative uh, and just come up with these ideas which allow you to, um, which allows Chris to draw out themes that, uh, so he can build them into your new spaces. Um, and, he does, and, and you can see how, to, and that, now many architects do that. Many architects do sort of say, oh, we, we want to look at, you know, we, we uh, want to know what you want in a space. But first of all, they, they don't take it very seriously, quite frankly. Right? The fact that architects you know, have a theme means they're not really truly doing it. Anyone who really takes into their clients, uh, their clients um, wishes to uh, sort of, uh, talk back derisively as builders. They're not architects, they're builders. Um, uh, you know, the, you know, as Chris says, you know, the architecture is taught as an art. You, know, you don't go and tell an artist, I want more red paint over here, right, on this, right, you just, so, you know, you don't tell an architect, I want, I don't want those sorts of windows, you know, hey, I'm, a, you know, don't mess with my, with, with my stuff, and you can tell how different it is if you look at his plans, so here, here are some of the plans that he's done, and you'll see that what, if you look at the space, he labels them with the psychological <laughs> feeling they are meant to evoke, so this is front and center, right on the plans and at all times, so Master Sleeping says, tranquility, heaven, S and then Sarah's a Right, so rejuvenation of spirit. Um, I can't see the, uh, something. Oh, I can look here, can't I? The master bathroom says private and personal. So you can see that what they have there is re really central at all times. And if you look at another one, it's not all the same, right? So here's another plan from somebody else. So here the master bedroom says privacy, passion, reflection. Okay? So they're saying different things to people. And using these plans, he really creates astonishing houses that the people are very um, happy with. I went to look at a, a couple of them. So this is one of the ones uh, where he does, where, where, and it's hard to see here, but you see up on the right, there's a sort of window coming out. The, the, this couple, let's say, talked about their real important moments of wandering around the villages in Tuscany and how that, that for them has been a real special moment. So he's built a space that evokes that feeling, a sort of floor that uh, is, uh, uh, reminds them of that. Um, this is a real interesting place. This is a, a top of a tower. This was a son of a lighthouse keeper, and he's built a kind of lighthouse on the top of the house, and it's a 360-degree view of the persons. Now, look, a lot of people describe themselves as view people. He says, I'm a view guy. And uh, uh, Chris says, really, what that means is it's people who are sort of seeking, often, what, what people really want to do is they want to sh show um, others, and often he said, you know, he's quite so psychodynamic in his approach. He thinks others, like their sort of father figure, how successful they want to, by view guy, they mean they want to sort of survey their dominion. Look what I have and I have acquired, look, at, look out in that. So I think it's, it's real, real interesting. Another, another point is a lot of these associations are really deeply hidden. We're not aware of them. We just say, oh, I like it. 
This is, oh, you can't really see this on, on the screen, but uh, you'll see there's a sort of there's a sort of island in the middle of this kitchen, and this was an old uh, so this was a, some a widow who was uh, getting over the uh, death of her husband, who was a doctor, um, and that and they and Chris made an island out of this old medical gurney which he used to have, and so this was a kind of connection to him because he used it in the garage but also to his profession and so on. And it's really interesting how deeply these connections run. So Chris was showing me around the house, and he was saying, oh, well, yes, you know, we, of course, use this because it's a connection to the husband or something like that. And the, and the woman uh, who, the, who, who owns the house, she, looked, she said, oh, that old thing, he just used it for paint cans, you know, like that. But as she did so, her face sort of flushed and tears welled up in her eyes, and then they were gone, like that. So it was clearly it was some... Um, important psychological symptoms, but we're not usually aware of them. And Chris, I think, is really tapping into them. So I must say, I was driving back from looking at these houses, feeling, you know, very superior about myself, saying, oh, these, these people, isn't it interesting how they are affected by the, these early processes? You know, Chris says that so often, you know, that we're, what we're trying to do is recreate a, a place where we felt happy and warm, often a grandmother's home. Um, and then, so I came back and I looked at my refrigerator. Now, you see, I'm a mess. <laughs> That is my refrigerator, and that, that's, again, not set up. If you look at my refrigerator now, it looks like that, and every day, that's how my refrigerator looks. Um, and I suddenly realized I was brought back to my own, to my own grandmother, and I remembered that when we, we used to go there, my brother and I would go with my mother, and we'd go to my gr gr grandmother's house, and they'd say, go play in the garden, you know, go have fun, you know, and it, we're going to talk and talk, you know, grown-up talk. If you, you know, if you're thirsty, just go to the drinks cabinet and help yourself to tonic water. Oh, so we can get a tonic water? And she said, no, 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 you know, as many as you like, you know. As many as we like? As many tonic water? The, I, this, you know, we, this was just unimagined uh, sense of abundance and never-ending tonic water. It could, it just, we couldn't imagine anything more decadent than not having to restrict the amount of tonic water we were allowed to drink <laughs> as a kid. And so then, and I hadn't really put two and two together until I spoke to Chris, but then I realized that what I have done is I have created my own sort of never-ending abundant <laughs> idea. You know, what happens is, you know, I, I do casually get, oh, you know, I mean, and my, the rest of my house, that's my desk on a good day, right? And that's, that's really what I'm like. Uh, you know, and then this is the one little domain, you know, and, and I, and, you know, and I, and I feel anxious if it's, you know, if it's running out. So, for example, if, if, uh, you know, offer somebody, you know, a tab and, and casually, yeah, sure, take a cab, and then when I like, go to the cupboard and replace it. <laughs> and, and it showed to me, of course, what, you know, really the, uh, the, you know, the real important roles of these, of these sort of, uh, you know, of these uh, early connections. Okay, I'm definitely running out of time, so I'm uh, going to stop, and if you have any questions, uh, I'd be happy to take them. I think we can take about five minutes of questions, if you would just come up. <laughs> right. you, there was cherries. You didn't see the cherries. <laughs> Sorry, I, I could put more. Co yeah, more tonic water. I love it. I like that idea. That is a great idea. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, so you touched on this a little bit when you were talking about the woman who had the movable feast and then the drinks cabinet and the medical gurney. It seemed at the beginning of the talk. Sorry. Is this better? Yes. It seemed at the beginning of your talk that you were looking at a lot of generalities and trying to study people yeah. in absentia. Yeah. And I've studied with Sherry Turkle at MIT, who's um, in the school of thought that you can't fully understand a person until you talk to that person about specific objects that mean something to them and mm -hmm. what it means to them. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering how you see these two kinds of approaches working together. I think it's very important. Matt. So you, you'll see that most of the analysis Analyses that I've done have been in terms of traits, the big five, and the, and and most of my field of personality psychology has dominated the big five, which study traits. And the reason people do it is because it's easy to measure. You can measure people's sort of regularities in behaviour. But quite frankly, it's boring, and it's not very deep. You know, what's really interesting are the deeper things like our goals, our values, and really, when you get down to it, I think a lot of what's going on in these things is. Um, identity, this sort of sense of who we are and this sort of narrative sense of what, what it means to be us and connects us to a path. And I think many, the sorts of things, the analyses you're talking about are really getting at things like identity. And, and, and I would love to too. It's just it's really hard to measure. I think that's what's interesting, quite frankly. But, you know, if, you're, you, know, if you want to publish papers, you know, yeah. so, so I, mean, I think 
you know, and, and, I, and you know, and I am doing some work looking at sort of in between things like values and goals and roles. But I, but uh, um, uh, so so I think both things are important. I think you can get from looking at the, you can make the generalities are useful for looking about traits. But if you really want to learn about people's identity, then then you absolutely need to take that approach of, of a, a much more personalized thing because the very same thing means can mean a, a number of different things to different people. But just to follow up, do you ever see a time in the future where we'll be able to start quantifying the anecdotal to yeah, quantifying quantifying all these the anecdotal cases? Oh uh, yeah, well, that's, I mean, there is work on it. There, so people are doing more work on values and roles right now. And Dan McAdams, uh, some of you may know him at, at Northwestern University, is doing some great work on identity. And so he's he's formalizing ways of of looking at these sort of different different uh, ways of characterizing people. Um, I mean, it's still a lot more work than traits, but he's at least sort of developing a framework with which that can be done. Thanks. People have talked about how uh, folks have one identity that they are feel is natural to them, and then they project another identity as a public persona. Yeah. So I was curious if you saw that sort of dichotomy. And then also, I'm dying to find out if anyone was, has experimented with trying to change their uh, personality yeah. by putting up different posters or using different stuff. Yeah. Um, well, um, okay, so the first question was uh, about, yeah, we sometimes try to project a different person. Yeah, and that, and that certainly happens, and we do. You know, we see that all the time. We see slight differences between, say, somebody's home environment and their work environment, and that does reflect real differences in, in, in the sense that we um, do need to... Um, Behave, you know, we behave slightly differently in, in these different contexts, but you also do see these attempts between private and personal spaces. You know, you see the, you know, the all the learned books on the, you know, in the coffee table in the living room. You know, they have, you know, you know, Kant and the Iliad, whereas you know they have you go into the bedroom and all the trashy novels that they really read. You know, and so people certainly do that. And within office spaces, you look at you look at places that are meant for others to see, and then sort of backstage area, and you sometimes see discrepancies. And and, and that that's useful in evaluating what people are like. And and we uh, in terms of changing our behaviors, um, you know, we do, we do that with ourselves sometimes. You know, we, we saw that I did a study of of my colleagues when we moved buildings. So we had our old building and then everybody moved to a new building and often when people go to a new office or a new space they take that as an opportunity okay i'm gonna you know i'm gonna become that organized person you know you know there's this you know this wonderfully optimistic moment about themselves they go off to you know office depot and begin to organize everything but you know as i have learned myself right is is, is it, it you have to live that way you can't just you know i mean i i you know you know, I organized my CD collection. It was all alphabetized and everything was in the right drawers. From went to Ikea and got the right drawers for it. And I thought, okay, that's it. I'm now an organized person. And I did. I had a you know, really organized CD collection for a day. You know, and, then, mm -hmm. and then I had to face up to who I was. Has anyone tried to experiment with, gee, I want to be a more outgoing person, well, and so I'm going to put up the Elvis poster? Um, Something I, I actually dramatic. tried to do a study like that, but it, uh, Exactly that way, because what you want to do is you want to have, it's quite difficult, it's you, want to have, you want to have one person decorating and then you want to have the other person having the identical space, so that like a sort of a yoke study where they are living in the same space, one per, you know, so you can really compare those. But of course it's, it's always hard to do it because they, things have different meanings to different people. So, um, uh, so I don't know of any research that has done that. I mean, we have looked at differences. We thought that maybe that's what was going on with Facebook profiles. So we thought maybe websites and Facebook profiles, what people are doing is there, they're projecting. This is who I want to be. And so what we did is we did one study where we, with Facebook where we found out what people were really like, and then uh, we, we had people judge people on their Facebook, and then we compared that both to how people really saw themselves but also we compare that to how people wanted to be, their ideal selves. And we thought, okay, are people projecting what they really, you know, other people seeing what they wanted to be, and it, tu it turns out that actually they may want to, but they're not successful if that's what they're doing. The, the, what, the people's impressions of people based on the Facebook profiles correlate with what they're really like, not their ideal selves. Mm -hmm. Thank you. In general. Uh, I was wondering that when, when you did these, um, it looked like there were, there were a lot of young people being your evaluators, yeah. and I was wondering if there, you found an, a necessity to account for differences, age or generational differences, between or among the people who are being yeah. evaluated and the evaluators? Absolutely. I think that's a crucial question. We haven't done that yet because we haven't had enough judges. So in all, most of these cases, they were 
you know, uh, psychology students who were, who were doing the judging, and therefore they may not have been as good. They may not have known the language of, of, of say, the offices, whereas they knew them of the dorm rooms. You know, and we all have that. We know there are expertise effects, right? If, if, um, if I go into, like, a woman's room, I see, oh, there is some lipstick, you know, whereas a woman goes in and says, oh, Mac, you know, not cover girl, what, you know, I don't know what it is, I'm already exhausted my knowledge of lipstick. <laughs> um, um, but, you know, so I, so I think there are others, what we have done is we have created a, but in order to test that question, which is a, a crucial question, this question of expertise, what you need is you need to have a lot of targets and a lot of judges. And so we've created a website where you, we now have a lot of people judging a lot of other people, where we will have the, the sort of data we need to address that. But, but I don't know the answer to your question. Thank you. It's a great question. Thank you very much. Oh.